for a reason. Oh, I didn't know we were live. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever the heck you are in the universe. This is Jeremiah's J-Man Monero, J-Man Speaks, and we're coming to and you I'm, live with... Wait, wait, you didn't let me do my... And I'm Jeffrey Scott Stanley. Yeah, and same with, that we, I'm with you, so you go... Oh. Oh, uh, here. Okay, this is well, Jeremiah's J-Man Jeff Monero. <laughs> and Jeffrey Scott Stanton. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Whoa, we missed you. Stuff. It's been a couple weeks because... You know, this guy over here, this guy right here, he's always so busy, so busy. Last week, he didn't even, it was like no call, no show, I'm literally. You. No call, no show. <laughs> That's true. It was no call, no show. No call. I need my coffee. No voice. show. Uh, it's the Double J Show. That's right. Back here. Check it, direct, and let's begin. Party on, party people. Let me hear some noise. We That's got amazing. Montana in the house. Jump, jump, rejoice. Can you move that off my head? Could you put just that up there? just just relax for a second. Hold on, I uh, just, I'll, I'll bring it up here. I swipe, swipe, bring Thank it up you. here, and then we also have Tennessee, 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 Tennessee. Brit, she's from uh, like Tennessee, Memphis, Tennessee, Tennessee area. Tennessee, Welcome Memphis. to the show. What are we talking about today? It's your topic. Finally, Jeffrey so, comes well, up with a topic, you, folks. Finally, hold on, DJ Airhorn. <laughs> Jeff came up with a topic. Write it in your diary. You put two topics. To, I sent you two topics, and you put two topics together. Listen, dude, I'm over scheduled just like you. So, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, what's the topic? You're like, uh, how to how to fail in real estate, and then quali um, qualifying auto winning qualifier versus auto winner. Auto qualify versus auto winners. Yeah. So I'm like, does that tie in with it? Who knows with your NLP stuff? No, it could be something you're separate. like, well, if you qualify, you're not winning and winning is not qualifying. And that's why you fail. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now let's just get silly. I'm hyped so, up and I haven't ate lunch yet. So let's go. Let's get the show on the road. You haven't ate or you haven't eaten lunch yet? I haven't ate. I haven't eaten. Lunch yet? <laughs> <laughs> J J Look at, this is J not J grammar class. Angry. Don't be a don't be Richard. Angry. Don't be your name is Jeffrey, <laughs> not Richard. Okay. Okay. So okay. today's topic was well, we'll let you pick one of the tips. So it was either how to fail in real estate, how to fail. I like it. Qualifier versus order winners. Maybe we'll cover both. So it was well, how to fail in real estate. I think everybody talks about how to succeed in real estate. Right. So let's talk about how do you fail. The inverse. Yeah. Let's say how do you fail in real estate. I think if we point out reasons why people fail, it's also if you're doing one of those things, then maybe you shouldn't do them because that's failure in real estate. Um, I think one of the biggest things, and I'll start with new agents, of why they fail in real estate is they don't know what to expect. And they think they're watching million dollar listing and they're going to, you know, show three prop. And I should be careful because my company's million dollar listing company. So if they show three properties, right. they do a high kick and then, hey, pick one of the three and they close a $30 million deal. Closes 20 minutes later. You know, it, it doesn't work that way. So I think a lot of times they don't realize how long it's going to take them to actually make money in this business. So well, a lot of times we'll tell agents, like, how much money do you have? If you're brand new, how much money do you have in reserves? Like, do you have enough to last six or eight months of your expenses if you're going to get into real estate? When I, I think part of it is the hiring process. Like, if you're a manager, you're a broker owner watching this right now, you shouldn't go, hey, uh, here, fog this. <sighs> All right, you you can come work for us. Like it's got to be on both sides. You got to look at it. You're you're a potential business owner. You want to interview the right broker for you that's going to provide the services that you need to succeed. Not it's not a job anymore, right? You're not going. Will you hire me? Yes, every single person will. <laughs> you know, but then that where you start is going to be kind of where you finish if you don't have the right support, the right training, the right mentor. Uh, like all of that is so important right in the beginning. And, and you said. You keep, so the key word there is job. I think people fail in this business because they treat it like a job, not as a career. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the difference. You know, we say all the time, are, are you are you an entrepreneur? Are you a CEO or are you an hourly employee? If you have that entrepreneurial CEO mindset, you'll be successful in this business. Or you can be successful in this business. If you have that hourly employee mindset, meaning that, hey, I'm used to punching a clock nine to five and that's what it happens to be, you're not going to be successful in this business. Am I throwing you off? Should I move over? Is that help your screen? 
Well, your hand looks ginormous. It's as big as my head, so I'm trying to fix it while you're talking. I'm like, ah, don't get me, please. Um, but you're saying, it, it, what's that mindset? If you're a nine to five employee and that's your mindset, it's much more difficult to be successful in this business. Yeah, and I always use that example when I'm like, I have a small group of agents that I coach individually, and you know, I'm like, let me ask you a question, okay? If you owned a business, because they do, but I said, if you owned a business and you were your only employee, would you pay you $100 an hour to do what you're doing right now? Mm-hmm. No. Um, I've, I'd fire myself. And- well, then you should... <laughs> So, so actually let's get there. So let's, let's, yeah. let's move there next. Cause that has to do with like, how do you build your business? So okay, to me that like I said, that initial thing is they don't know what to expect. They think they're going to get a commission check within, you know, 30 days or 60 days, 90 days. You know, it's not uncommon depending upon the area for someone to be six, eight months a year before they're getting their first deal. So I think it's just having that expectation and having that money, the bank or that, <clears throat> or the, um, the reserve fund to be successful, you know, in order to get you through that. Um, and, and I also think that it's not enough agents look at potentially when they start to join a team to start. But I think that's a great place to start depending upon your the team that you're going to join. But a lot of times, you know, Jim, we've been in this business long enough that you can tell the first time you talk to a person if they're, and they're new, if they're going to be successful in this business or not. Like we really can. It's just, we've seen, we've seen it all. So with those people, it's like, Hey, maybe join a team instead of trying to do this your own. And then I liked your comment of, would you pay yourself a hundred dollars to do this? Because that is, you know, to me, why people fail in real estate is they do the things that they should be paying someone else to do. That takes up their time because your hundred percent of your job in this business is getting into conversations with people. That's a hundred percent of what you do in this. Everything else can be delegated out. Right. Generating revenue without, without revenue, your business ceases to exist. Everything else that you're talking about. Well, I have to brand. I have to, you know, build it. I have to do social media. You said I have to do social media and video. Yeah. But without revenue, all of that <sighs> disappears. Means nothing. It means nothing. <clears throat> so listen. So uh, at what point in your business? Because I I really believe it takes probably a minimum of three years to say you're successful in this industry when you're doing it alone. Like for your brand new agent, you're doing this alone. I'd probably say three years is that mark. Because the the statistic is within the first year, eighty percent of the people who are licensed that year and join real estate will be out of real estate. Within five years, it's an additional eighty percent of the twenty percent that's that's left. So you're right. talking about dwindling numbers. And so to me, it's that three-year mark is usually that decision-making mark. Like, is this something I want to make a career out of? Or is this something I just did in passing because I got my real estate license because I was going to sell my house myself? Well, I know you guys get that a lot with the, with the you know, being in Manhattan and the lar- you know, those larger markets. It's like, oh, I'm going to sell my cousin's $2 million house. I'm going to get my license. We don't run into that too often. But I think... What you want to think about, if you're an agent who's gotten in the business since 2020, right, since we've been in this kind of the seller's market, you really need to start planning your business because you've been, I don't want to say you've been lucky, but it's like if you get a listing, it's selling and it doesn't require much skill. When we're going to see these agents fall and fail is because they don't have a plan in place for your your hand was like on my cheek. <laughs> Boom. Um, you know, the, the agents fail because the agents that are going to fail are the ones that don't have a plan for when the market changes, for when they have to have a conversation with a seller about, I know it's been a day and we haven't <laughs> sold yet or a month <clears throat> or two months or six months and, you know, have, have the reserves in place to carry those listings to do above and beyond, to do more marketing. Uh, those are the people that are going to fail for sure. And this is, and this is what I say, when you first start in this business, you're in survival mode. That is, you're surviving. That, that's truly what it is. And it's difficult to get out of survival mode. Then I think you really go from survival mode to a job where it becomes a job now. And then you move from job to career. 
And then you move from career to calling. And then you actually move to significance. Like, I think that's the journey. So like a lot of agents are in that survival mode because they're trying to do things just to get, um, just uh, people walking by my office, just to get it done. Like, just like, oh, I needed to, I got to pay my rent, so I got to do a deal. So right. at that three-year point to me is, is that three to five-year point is when you actually s- can start becoming successful. And I think at that three to five-year mark and why people fail in real estate is they don't have enough spinning plates or as we just call it, legs on a table. It's they go after one marketing niche that they've done and all of a sudden that dries up. And then, oh, now I got to go scramble. So I think agents fail because they don't have enough things like so I'm not saying you spread yourself too thin, but you need at least three or four active ways of getting business. Is it right. social media? Is it buying leads? Is it your sphere of influence? Is it is it you know whatever it happens to be? But I think you need at least four because I've noticed the agents that fail rely on one or two lead generating activities. Like think about all the agents who their biggest lead generating activity was door knocking over the past year and a half. What do you do then? And, and one of those yeah. legs or one of those should be always be the sphere of influence of past clients, the people who know you and your past clients should always be in there. And, and I think this market is one where I'm not going to say I am one of them, but those of us who are really busy and, and you love the, the prospecting side of it or not the prospecting side, but the, ac- the activities and the action. Right, are the one we're the ones that don't stay in contact with our clients as often as we should, and then when the market starts to slow down, they're like, "What? Now you want to talk to me? You were where were you the last two years when you were selling all that real estate? You were too busy. Not that I've ever had that conversation. Yeah, when when, it, when I actually had my coaching training company before I joined Element, <clears throat> we actually went to people who are successful in real estate, insurance, financial sales had to be 20 plus years in the business. And we interviewed them. And I asked one of the questions, I'm gonna paraphrase it, I'm gonna the whole question is, knowing what you know now, what would you have done from day one? And this, these are people who are super successful, 20 plus years, top producers. Their thing was, I would have made sure every single person I know and every single person I did business with knows what I do and I would tell them constantly. Because if I did that from day one, I would not be going out there now looking for business. I would have the business coming to me. Right. And these are super stuff, 20 plus years in business in all service industries like we are, financial services, insurance, and real estate. And, and I think that's why a lot of them fail in real estate is because we, we don't think it's one of those where there's, it's, there's what's called in, in a sales call reluctancy. There's what's called a friend fear and a fam fear or a friend shield and a fam shield that some people have a reluctancy and that's a psychological reluctancy to ask family for business and ask friends for business. Some people actually have a psychological reluctancy of asking past clients for business. And it's one of those where they're difficult. Their sales call reluctancy is proven sales call reluctancy. It's not just in your head. Like right. it is. So right. I think that should be is like starting out from day one is like, pestering people to say, Hey, you know, I'm in real estate, right? You know, I'm in real estate, right? You know, I'm like, you have to constantly remind people. And I think the other part of that is the past clients. Do you know the average number of times or let me take it back. Do you know the percentage of real estate agents that stay in touch with their past clients on a consistent basis? 12%. Yeah. Something like 18%. Oh, like it's closer than before. Good. See, uh, here's one of the things I want you guys to realize. Dr. Jeffrey Scott Stanton does not ask a question that he does not already know the answer to. So quite often he's trying to trap you. I'm not trying to trap you. I'm trying to bring you through your own learnings, J-Man. I, I'll think. See <clears> what <throat> I mean? Do you guys see what I'm talking about here? No. <laughs> but think about that. If only we'll, we'll make the number easy. Say 20% of real estate yeah. agents stay in contact on a consistent basis. That's why they fail because people like me and J-Man and the other rock star agents is constant contact with the people who already know us. No, it's, it's the truth. So I think agents fail when they realize, oh, crap, the market's turned. The market's slowed down. I haven't stayed in touch with anyone. What do I do now? You know, what, what, like I always tell people this. Think about it this way. 
Jamin, if they say we always talk about, listen, you could parachute me and Jamin into any area, in any spot in the country, and we could be successful doing this. Like any it's area truth. In the world. It, Drop I, me I off in France, and I'll find a way to sell. I don't know. I my... get an interpreter. I, that's exactly that's what I would do. I know friends like some. I'd be like, "Oh, hola." Uh, no, I'd be like, "Cómo se va? ¿Sabes bien?" Oh, yeah. Je m'appelle Jean Luc. Tu ne peux parler français avec moi. That's all I got. <coughs> four years of French. I took Russian in high school, and I remember like four words. Russian? Okay. Yeah, I went to a technical high school. Anyhow, so you know, only twenty percent stay in touch. The market shifts, and all of a sudden, it's like, "Oh, what do I do? What do I do?" You know. Most people, when you're at 10 plus years in this business, and if you're not heavy into buying leads and heavy into marketing, it's close to 90% of your business comes from people like your past clients, comes through referrals, comes through introductions. So I think it's we forget about those people. We get so busy because it's such a seller's market that, oh, I forgot to sell my newsletter. Oh, I'll do it next month. Well, no, because guess what? If you're going to stay in touch with people, and that's part of being of not failing in this business, because if you want to fail in this industry, Close the deal and move to the next deal and don't worry about what you just did to that person. Like that's the easy way of failing in this business. Easy. Cause it is gonna change, I think, very soon, depending on where you are. But the um the other part, let's talk about social media for a second, because you did mention that. I think the best way to fail, and I gotta move you over again because your 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 green screen's bothering me. I move but around. the um best way to fail is to treat social media like a business. And what I mean by that is like, I go on, if you friend request me and your business card is your cover photo on your personal profile, it's an automatic no for me, right? Or, or like you friend me and then automatically like, Hey, like my business. I'm like, no, mm -mm. I need room for, for new friends that are actual going to be real relationships. You trying to refocus? I just got no. I just yeah. I'm trying to refocus. I just got really blurry. There we go. There so, see, Jeffrey, you just have to focus sometimes. Focus. <laughs> well, I think there's another thing is agents don't focus. Like people who fail, always are going after the new shiny penny, the dangly keys. Oh, I and again, and I'll say this about me and J Man too. You come to one of our seminars. You go to Jamie and say, oh, I'm going oh, social media, social media, social media, social media. And that's the new shiny penny. Ooh, messenger bot. That's the new shiny penny for them. And they do it, and they do it for three or four days. And then, nope, doesn't work. Let me try something else. It, nothing's going to work in three or four days. You know, they say if you yeah. send out mailers or postcards that it takes 12 to 18 months for them to even start recognizing your postcards and for you actually to get any business. So – it's, it's always good to try new things, but you have to have your core, what you're going to do there. And if your core is social media, great, but you're right is don't treat your social media, unless it's your business page, like a, like a giant business card. If that's what you want to do, go to LinkedIn because that's what LinkedIn's for. I'm going to say, and hearing what you just said, being consistent is also important mm -hmm. uh, because another great example, we have this, this predictive data system that we have. And somebody signed up for it, and then four months later they canceled. <laughs> and I'm like, "Well, just you know, looking for feedback. Why did you did it not work for you, or or did you just not work it?" And she's like, "Well, the team didn't do anything with it." Okay, <laughs> let them go. You know, say, but it's like <clears throat> they didn't give it a try. And like so many things, as you start to uh, figure out multiple ways for for you to bring in that business, whether it's sphere, whether it's data, which is the future of everything, messenger bots. Like you got to have all these, we call them, you know, spokes and hub mentality, all these spokes driving traffic back to your hub. Uh, but you have to actually be consistent and, and efficient and effective, right? Go back and, and at the end of the year or at, at any time you have the time, look at what's working, see what's worked for you. Don't just keep doing things because somebody told you you yeah. should. And it may be that you tried a program, you tried a service, and you did it. And it didn't work for you. That's fine, but go back and see why it didn't. Was it the software? Was it the program? Was it how you worked the program and how you didn't work the program? You know, it's that recap or debrief. Like anything we do as new as a company, we beta test things. So we'll give it to a group of, you know, 50 right. agents that, hey, play with this for the next six months. Let us know what you think about it. 
And then we go in, how much did they use it? When the uh, one agent says, oh, I didn't like it at all. And you go in, oh, you logged into the system twice. Right. So, I, you know, right. so it, it is, right. if you're going to do something, set a time limit and a realistic time limit that you're going to give that test. Because the agents that go from social media, oh, I'm going to door knock. Oh, no, I'm going to cold call. No, I'm going to do flyers. No, I'm going to do... Those are the agents that fail. And it's real easy to fail by spending more money than you should on stupid things that you probably shouldn't be doing. Could you get on your own side of the screen, please? I'm trying. It's just I get an, I There's so many. Yeah, I'm so easily distracted. <laughs> <laughs> Dangly keys. Uh, I'm just like, I don't like the angle. I don't like the angle of my microphone. Because so you I'm realize like just... your shoulders were like shoulder to shoulder here. Could you move that way? One moment, please. No, it's not going to. <clears throat> so, again, is there any other questions? Pipe, pipe in the chat. Why do you think people fail? I think one of the reasons fail is you're on my side. They think they think they just have a sales job. I think the worst thing in any single licensing is a licensed real estate salesperson. I, I think that is the worst because that may be your license title. But if you treat this job just like a salesperson, I just got distracted. If you treat this job like a salesperson, <laughs> like like if you just think your only job is sales, not gonna work. Right. You're gonna fail. Yeah. You know, what else yeah. do you think you'll fail? Hmm. I think. Oh, we got Hannah's in the building too on Britt's account. I think also uh, not having the reserves, right? So uh, I'm fortunate enough, my wife and I are a team, like I'm the get it done, she's the get it right personality. And, you know, after every commission check comes in, she takes an amount, goes it into taxes, takes an amount, mm -hmm. goes into an, uh, a reserve fund so that if, right? Because right now we're going into the winter and was last winter okay? Yeah, record breaking. But who knows? So not having the reserves, and when you look at every single small business in your community that failed throughout the pandemic, that's exactly why. They didn't have the money to sustain a prolonged <coughs> period of reduced revenue. And you have to look at like, okay, I got these big commission checks. Don't go buy yourself fancy cars and all this other stuff to just, you know, drip on other people. <laughs> like you, you need to put that money away so that if this winter is bad, you know, we're in upstate New York, but even if it's bad just because of the time of year for you, not necessarily the weather, that you can sustain that. And then your competitors, they're not going to have the money to do all the things you're going to be doing in the spring. So let's actually talk about beyond this. So we're at the five-year, the 10-year point. This is why I believe a, why they fail at that point, or we'll say they don't succeed or don't hit the level that they want to or that they should actually be able to. And I think one of the things is, Agents don't know when to get an assistant. I think that's the first thing. When you see people hit a plateau, my first question is, do you have an assistant? Oh, no, no, I, I don't want to pay an assistant. Listen, as Jamie said, uh, would you pay yourself? And this is the easiest way to do it. <clears throat> Figure out how much you get paid per hour to do your business. So if you take, if you and this is, the, this is for a person with very little skill, take right. the ima amount of commission that you make per deal, Divide it by 36 because it's anywhere from 35 to 38 hours of lead generating activity to get one deal and then get that deal closed. So that's your hourly rate of pay to actually be out there talking to people, cold calling, door knocking, whatever it happens to be. So understand when you're there filling out a form or putting something in the MLS, that was your hourly rate of pay. So when you look at that and say, like we've done this before in classes and we have agents that have a $2,000 hourly rate of pay. Three thousand mm -hmm. dollar. Listen, your hourly rate of pay, depending upon your market, maybe one hundred and fifty dollars. But there's the thing: you're looking and you're filling out a form or putting something in the MLS. Is that worth a hundred? Because listen, you're not paying someone else that, but you're taking away the hundred and fifty dollars for that hour that you could be out there generating activity. So when you get to that, see, my first thing is when I realized that I was spending more time in the office doing paperwork and doing the stuff I did not like to do. I'm like, I'm getting an assistant. Right. I paid for it myself. Didn't go to the company and say, oh, pay for my assistant. I paid for it myself. And then, so I think that's the first thing to make sure you don't fail. 
and to me, I always tell people when you're going to get an assistant is you want to like write down the list of things. I have this conversation with agents all the time. What don't you like to do? Write down the list of things you don't like to do. And that starts their job description. Well, let's say this. If you're watching this now, you're watching it live or on the replay. If you send us the keyword VA stuff, I believe it is. It should work. Uh, VA stuff. It'll auto reply with, with a one sheet that we created for virtual assistants. It's based on a interview we did with somebody who specializes on virtual assistants, but they do talk a lot about, there's a website, virtual assistant assistants.com. They analyze all the different ones that are available, but a good example, right? And I heard this analogy on a podcast the other day. So I'm, I'm just going to rip off and duplicate as many of us do. Well, let's say here's my bucket, right? Closer. Um, here's my bucket and I can only fill it, fill this up so much, right? Let, let's with coffee, let's call it cause coffee's for closers until I start going like this and I start spilling coffee over the side. The spilling of the coffee is lost business, right? That's when you, when you're like, oh shoot, I was supposed to call that person back. Oh man, I had that listing. Oh, and you, you if you'll know when you're there. And, and you can't look at it as like an, an expense. It's an investment into your business. I um, believe it's VA stuff. If people type in VA stuff, VA stuff, I believe it's VA stuff. Without VA yeah. Stuff. Not in the comments. If you type, send me the message. Uh, I'm sorry. I said comments. Yeah, didn't send I? Me, a send me a message on the Facebook page. But if not, those of you who have sent the message uh, in the comments, I'll, I'll send you the information as well. But um, another great example, the other day I was out showing houses two different buyers. One was virtual. So I had four showings via zoom. And then I had uh, four in-person showings with a different buyer. So I left the in-person buyer and I said, okay, they wanted to write an offer. Okay. We're going to send you the offer the next 15 minutes or so. They go, well, you're going to do that while you're driving. No, I'm not going to do it at all. I'm going to call a licensed assistant that I, that I have and say, here it is. We're going to write this offer for 250 conventional financing, 80% down, and I just give them all the terms, conditions. They fill in the blanks. You know why? Because my time is so precious. I need to go help another buyer find the home of their dreams. And that's how you got to think about it. And you fail when you think you have to do everything yourself. Like when you have that, no, I have to do I'm the only one that's going to be able to do this right. right. Control freaks. Yeah. It is. And that's usually over Paris. If you had a plateau in your business, hire a coach to help you analyze. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and in, this is the biggest thing. If you're at that 10 year mark, five year mark, this is what I suggest you do for a week, track everything you do and how much time you spend on doing it. And at the end <laughs> of the week, look at it. Yeah. At the end of the week, look at it. And if you're saying, Hey, like I feel like run down. I feel so, I'm so busy. I can't get stuff done. Look at that. Because the reason why people fail in real estate is they don't do that. They don't keep track of what they're doing. You need to just do it for a full week and then realize, Oh, wow. So I'm spending an hour, three hours a week putting stuff in the MLS, ordering photography, setting up the virtual stage. Ten hours you know, social when you look media. At, <laughs> when you look at all of a sudden, you got 25 hours worth of the week time is your social media posts and scheduling appointments and setting up a virtual, setting up stagers and doing those types of things. Is that worth your time and money? Right. And I take, think, hold on, take that log, you look at it, and then go uh, pr pretend it's your employee evaluation, you're sitting across from yourself going, mm -hmm. here's everything you did this week, Jeffrey. You're fired. You're, fi yeah. you're fired, because bro. You because you should have been out there. You should have been out there talking to people and selling and making the deals where maybe you're the one that <clears throat> I hit a plateau and, and I don't know what I'm going to do now. And maybe it's because you think you're spending more time on real estate than you actually are. Maybe there's, you know, 12 hours a week that you're out at lunch with the other brokers and other agents that like, look at that because that's the reason why people fail. And then after that, like, listen to me, when I, when I built my <clears throat> team is, was an assistant first right. and then it was, I'm going to build a team. Now there's Leverage. reasons to build a team and there's reasons not to build a team. I didn't build a team saying, Oh, I'm going to hire people. I'm going to make money off of that. That's not the reason why I build my team. If you have that intention of building your team that way, the team is not going to last. If you have the intention of, I'm just going to put people on my team and they're going to do their own thing and I'm going to make money off them, that's not a team that you operating like a mini brokerage. 
multi-level marketing is for you if that's what you enjoy. <laughs> but for me, it was, I realized that it was my original assistant who was really good talking on the phone with my buyers. And she said, hey, Jeff, I'm thinking about getting a real estate license. I said, great. This is what we do. Find an assistant to replace you. And I'm going to bring you on. And you're going to be my buyer's agent. Because I realized that I was spending more time with buyers than I was at listing appointments and dealing with sellers when my time was best spent of getting those sellers to say yes 100%. to list with us. Yeah. And, and, and I that's think how especially I started building my team. In this market, that would definitely, after the assistant, that's the first person I would get because like working with buyers, I love them. Don't get me wrong, but they're the biggest time suck of, uh, if you look at your whole schedule, say, okay, I would love to bring on a, a buyer specialist so you can work with sellers because that's what you need more than anything else. It's a seller's market, guys. If you're frustrated and, from working with buyers, <coughs> get sellers. Let's, let's go back to 2007, 2008, 2009, depending upon where you were in the country. Yes. You were only dealing with sellers. Buyers will walk in. You're like, no. Shoot, <laughs> a buyer would call you about a listing and like you would never call them back. I feel that a lot of agents are putting themselves in that situation right now where we're so heavily focused on sellers that we're blowing up the buyers. The industry switches and it becomes, if it becomes, and I'm not making a forward looking statement, if it becomes a buyer where it becomes buyer market, <laughs> you're so you're, corporate. Like, yeah, it's forward looking. I'm sorry, I have to be careful. Yeah. But if it becomes buyer market, then what? Oh crap! I just, I just blew I just, off. Yeah, I just pooped on buyers, buyers for years. A, for a year and a half, two years. Now what? So I think it's what it is that they are never looking at, like, where's my business coming from and where else? I think again, if I only work with sellers, you're putting all your eggs in one basket. I think the longer you're in this industry the larger percentage of sellers you will work with over buyers. When you're brand new, you probably work with 90% buyers, 10% sellers. Right. And I think right. that levels out, but you can't forget about those buyers. You can't not stay in contact with those buyers because the market turns around, oh crap, I don't have any buyers. I have two listings because I've been focused on getting listings. As I said, it's, it's they fail because they don't want to build a team or they build a team for the wrong reason. Well, let's see this. Looking at Billy's comment about about hiring a coach, and it doesn't have to be like somebody that you, you're necessarily paying. But there's two people I feel like are critical to your business, and without them, you you could possibly fail. Having a mentor, number one, mm -hmm. and number two, having a coach. The mentor helps to train you in the business. The coach helps you to hold to hold you accountable. Right? It's two two different things. The coach isn't always a nice guy because it's like here's the things you need to do to be successful. And you go back and meet with the coach. Sorry, coach, I didn't get it done. Why? Um, um, hmm, cricket. <laughs> yes, perfect cricket usage. Uh, but, but the mentor really can, can, because without it, it's like when I, in that 2008, when I moved from one brokerage to another, I found a mentor in the new company that was in the business for 35 years. Like I was good at technology. He was, had just experience. There's no substitute for that. Right. And so we, we partnered together and we would, we would door knock expireds at that point. Cause there were so many properties that were selling, but, and we both, both brought something to the table. He learned from me. I learned from him. So it was a, a symbiotic relationship. That's what I would be thinking about. Yeah, right and now. This is, and people think they don't need them. Oh, I've been in business so long. I don't need a mentor. Well, maybe the mentor is your broker. Maybe it's your executive. Maybe it's a different business leader. Like I said, I'm right. fortunate enough where I work. Listen, we have some of the greatest industry icons. You know, Donnie Herman, Howard Lorber, Scott Dirk, and we have for those in California, Peter Hernandez. And Peter Hernandez in California is an icon in the industry. Like he was at one point was the the CEO or president of Coldwell Banker California. Like, like I have those fortunate the company I work for that these people are still my mentors. What was that? You're popping your collar. Sorry. I was oh, my pop, my collar. I was popping oh, okay. it for you. So it, it's one of those things where by the company I work for, I have those mentors built in, but I have mentors that are outside of the real estate industry. Right. They don't have, have to be in the industry. Mentor. Yeah, for sure. Like I have I have CEOs Great of point. companies that we it's I don't know if it's mentor mentee. It's almost like this weird coaching relationship type of right. thing. Where mm -hmm. like I'll have an idea, I'll bounce with them and they're a different industry and they'll say, Jeff. Well, we would do it this way in our industry, or they would come to me. And so we have this weird 
like mutual coaching slash friendship slash mentor. And it's hugely helpful for me because you can see things from outside. And I, and I think when we get so experienced, how to fail easily when you're experienced is to think you know everything. Right. Yeah, I, I could say from a speaking instructor's like when you talk about speakers or speakers, instructors, and trainers, right? I mean, it's kind of three separate fields. And once you reach a certain level, not to say, I'm never going to say I'm the best at what I do, but I'm always trying to get better. And, and I ask people outside the industry, there's people that are making, you know, 10 times what I make a, a year. How did you do that? And and I'm never, I'm never too proud to ask that. Like it's it just, sometimes you got to just swallow your pride. And be like, yo, I'm doing Okay. But how can I get to your level? What 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 are the minute, uh, you know, changes you made to your business to go to the? There's always another level, always. You know, it's I'm, I'm fortunate that like I, like I'm friends with Tony Robbins, know him personally, so I had a conversation with him and I said, get him get him on the get I him on the get him on the podcast, <laughs> show me. I like, and this one this one because Jimmy and I did the same thing too. We, we were travel instructors, travel trainers, travel speakers, and I said, I said to him. This is when I had my own training company. I want to make more money. And he says, do you need to make more money? I said, no, I don't. I said, I want to. He says, perfect. So you already have your needs met. And I said, how did you go from I'm selling audio tapes to I'm selling out to 30,000 Madison people? Square Garden. Right. Yeah. And he says, this is how you stop. This is how you make more money doing what you're doing. Stop doing it for you and do it for the people that are in your audience. Once you do it for the people that are in your audience – automatically more people are going to want to see what you do. And I'm like, but I am doing it. And he says, yeah, thank you. And he says, you are? He goes, are you doing it for that paycheck? I said, well, both. He says, when you forget about the paycheck and you just do it for the people that are there. And so I, we came up with this thing that my motto was that it doesn't matter who I teach, it doesn't matter who I speak to, as long as I gain profound wisdom and insight and share them with the people and share it with the people that are put in front of me. And, th and it was totally like, and I really went from having two or 300 people of my big sessions to having 15 and 16 and 1700 people. The biggest session I ever taught was 2,800 people. And it wasn't at an art convention. This was an outside paid gig. And so it's one of those things where I think you're right. It's having that humility to be able to go to that person and say, how did you get to, like, I want to get to where you are. How did you do it? What's like, what advice or what tips you, can you give me? I think it's a matter of if you're a brand new agent or you've been in the business 30 years. Well, and on the reverse side of that, let's say you've been in the business 30 years and you're watching this, mm -hmm. right? Don't be so dumb. I want to say it's a nice way to say that, yeah. but to, to go, I've been in the business 30 years. Mm -hmm. There's new agents coming in that are doing things way outside the box or that they're good at technology. They're good at social media. They're good at video natively. Like, like, they just comes to them naturally and you've been in it 30 years, you're good at real estate, but you can add these little, you know, these little things to your, to your, uh, real estate business that can make all the difference, but you're too busy sitting on your high horse going, well, I've been in the business 30 years and you know how much I sell each year. That's fine. You could always yep. learn new things. Old dog, new tricks. So we, we do a program internally called a restart program where we meet when we're doing it in person, we meet once a week for a course of seven weeks. And it literally is a psychology of sales and a huge amount of accountability. So we go through psychology, we go through sales, negotiations, it, 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 and it's really a tough program. And the way it works is if you're late, you can go up to the front of the room. If you're less than a half hour late, but you're late, you can go up to the front of the room and do a sing-along during lunch, you know, yes. karaoke, and we'll let can you Can you pick in. your song? You, or... more than a half, you can pick your song. Okay. But if you're more than a half hour late, you can't come in. And guess what? You're out of the program. So we were getting a lot of people that were making for us around that like $250,000 GCI. And for us in New York City, that's an average producer. So we were having average producers going and we wanted to get out to, to the more seasoned agents. And I was speaking with one of them. I've been in this business 35 years. I don't need this stuff. We had an agent that went from $250,000, went through our seven week programs. At the end of the year, he closed $750,000 in gross commission income sat next to her. She comes to me, she's like, how's he doing what he's doing? I said, wait, I thought you've been in this business 35 years. She goes, all right, I'm going to join your program. Mm -hmm. Because I said, and, and now, ready for this, Balling. she went from $750,000 per year to her now GCI income is $1.5 million per year. 
Holler. So it, you never, you never, you're never too old to learn. Or maybe it's just for the experienced people how to fail in businesses. You forgot about the things that made you successful. So a lot of time it is going back to the core of the what basics. made me successful. What can I do more of? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, and and kind of along the same line, when I first started, and I say like it's gotten better over time, but. Yeah. Man, I had a chip in my shoulder, bro. I, we've talked about this before too, where it's like, yeah. I'm like, I don't need you. I don't need anybody. I'll do this myself. And it's like, that just comes from some <laughs> repressed. If I talked to the, the doctor <laughs> here, right? It's so just some <laughs> some childhood issues that are unresolved there, folks. But it's as soon as I said, hey, let's work together on this. Let's collaborate. Or even like I go. It doesn't have to be someone in the same company either, guys. Like, go into another company. Man, you're really crushing it with this. How are you doing it? And and somebody who's really confident, like I could have a speaker in my own market say, "How do you do this stuff that you're doing with the live streaming and all that?" And I'll say, "Come to the office. I'll show you everything." You know, like that's when you're confident in what you're doing. Same thing in real estate. I'll show you everything that I'm doing. I I show people all the time. I'm not worried about them taking my business you got to have an abundance mindset where there's enough on the table for all of us to eat we yeah, can all we eat did, um, so we have the Ellen podcast series which this will be a part of probably next week and they'll go up oh but yeah okay do, you're like little orphan Annie okay let me just say that we've been doing so on Wednesdays we do real estate de deconstructor or deconstructors so we were doing a whole bunch of NLP podcasts and then we were the last two we did was on the NLP version of the listing consultation and one of the and we go literally through almost the entire listing consultation or listing presentation. We call it a consultation. And one of our agents, because we do it via Zoom, but you can listen to SoundCloud, iTunes, whatever. Um, plug. You can listen to it via uh, on Zoom and says to me, why are we making this public? Everybody's going to know our secrets. And I said, but they're not us. Like, they don't have the stats. They don't have the data. And the other thing is, I'll share it. Because honestly, 90% of the people are never going to do it. Just like Jamie, even if it was a competition, Jamie, you sit down and show somebody how do you stream on social media, this and that. 90% of the people, if it's another instructor, 90% of them are never going to do it anyway. Right. So guess what? I feel better that, hey, we're putting this out to the world. If we can help, we, we will. But it's up to you if you want that help or not. Well, and even I could transcribe everything that we say today, give you the script. Mm -hmm. You could say everything that we're saying, but it's the delivery of what we do yep. that makes us all unique and different. And people buy yeah. into that. Absolutely. Listen, it's really easy to fail in this business. Really easy. It's well, I think we're going to wrap it up here. No? We're going to wrap it up? I wasn't even looking at the time. 120. Does anybody have any questions? Is there anything anybody wants any to wrap questions? up on? Questions or something we any can cover? Questions. Any closing tips? Mr. Jeremiah, Shane? Um, I got one, but you go first. Now you go first. All right. I'm going to leave you with this. Uh, when I, even before real estate, when I started as a young man in business, I went to see a guy by the name of Les Brown. Legend. Okay. Legend. And the one quote that always resonated with me was, we must do the things today that others won't do. So tomorrow, we can have what others won't have. Thank you. Thank you. I, I don't have the button. I was going to do that. Yeah. I agree with you 100%. And I think that's that's a great way to end it. But, Jamin, I have a question. Yeah. But how many people are actually going to do those things? Well, not a lot. And that's why you won't have the things that others won't have. Like uh, the other one that ties into is like everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die to get there. Right. It requires sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> it requires sacrifice. You got to you got to be ready. You got to get you know, you got to commit desire without discipline leads to disappointment. I got them all. Boom, 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 boom. Rapid fire. Peace and love, everybody. Cool. This is a good, good conversation today. Finally. I am Jeffy Scott Stanton, Douglas Elman Real Estate. You are Jeremiah's J Man Monero with J Man Speaks. Make it a great day. And this is much to say about nothing. Something. <laughs> See you in the next one.